And there you are. Take it away, Doc. All right. Welcome back. We're here with another Q&A. Anything I say is not meant to diagnose or replace your medical care. Check with your doctor before implementing any of the things we're going to dive into. We have some really interesting questions. We have some great people on the green screen. So bring in your questions and let's dive right in. Well, we do have an international host of folks in there. So why don't we start off with what's going on internationally? So we'd like to say a good morning to all of our viewers joining us this morning from the UK, Canada, Mexico, Algeria, Jordan, Greece, Pakistan, the Philippines, Ireland, Ethiopia, Australia, Poland, France, Switzerland, South Africa, Lebanon, Eritrea, Eritrea, Eritrea thank you, Terry, Kenya, Turkey, Armenia, Qatar, the Virgin Islands, Guyana, Barbados, Italy, the Czech Republic, Finland, Bulgaria, Australia, Iran, Romania, Norway, Dubai, Albania, Albania, excuse me, Spain, Scotland, uh, St. Uh, Lucia, India, Japan, the Netherlands, Sweden, the United Arab Emirates, Brunei, Nigeria, Bangladesh, Peru, Egypt, Panama, Islamabad, Germany, uh, Tasmania, Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, Uz Uzbekistan, the Bahamas, the Republic of Congo, Portugal, South Korea, Chile, and all across these United States. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. Terrific to have you. And why don't we shoot right to, um, right to social media. Rebecca from Facebook, what are your thoughts about drinking mushroom coffee? I've seen it advertised quite a bit lately. There's some fascinating um, properties in mushrooms for your brain, anti-cancer, your mood. I think it's a great idea. I think it's a great idea, especially in the morning, um, to to replace it for coffee. It's and and the ones that I think that you're thinking of, um, I think it's cordyceps tends to. Um, I'm going to turn this down. I can hear the feedback there. Is that better, Steve? Uh, yeah, I can't hear it coming over the ear, but anyway, go ahead. Okay, so uh, cordyceps it helps uh, as an adaptogen, so it helps your stress. It helps you adapt to stress. So that would be a great thing to start your morning off with. Um, yeah, I like that concept. In fact, I've never done that, but I think I'm, I may try it. I may try it. So I'll let you know what happens. All right. Very good. A fee from YouTube. Should I take 500 milligrams of berberine before or after a meal? Good question. It's not going to make that big of a difference. So, um, you know, whatever's more convenient. I mean, the, the changes are going to be very, very subtle. So, um, you know, these things, there's, there's a lot of things in nutrition that are subtle and or trivial that people kind of make into this, so oh, you must take this pill, you know, this particular time. But as far as before, or after you eat, it really doesn't make a difference. All right, very good. James from Facebook, I know you recommend avoiding most seed oils. What's your take on peanut oil? Is it uh, part of a healthy diet? It's, it's better, uh, but it's still omega-6. Um, it's from, because it's, uh, from a legume. And so, you know, and, and then the other thing is, um, you know, you have at, at the very least peanuts are not GMO, even though they do spray them with a lot of chemicals because it's in the ground and the soil. So we have that issue, but, um, the typical soils like the corn and the soy, uh, soy are GMO. So at the very least, it's not usually going to be a GMO product. So it would be a little bit better. All right. True blue from YouTube. I have heart disease. Sorry to hear that. Uh, what would be the best diet for me? Healthy keto or carnivore? I think healthy uh, keto would be great unless you have digestive gut inflammation. I think healthy keto would be great. Um, I think that's the right thing you need to do. I mean, take a look at, uh, if you go to drberg.com and just start reading those success stories, there's, I think, almost 8,000. And I wish it would have started at the very beginning because we only fairly recently started collecting them. But you'll see amazing successes, and that might give you some encouragement. All right, True Blue, we're rooting for you. Adapt that healthy diet and stick with us. Susan from Facebook, what is the best advice you can share about tinnitus? I have several videos on tinnitus. One is a technique that works about maybe 50% of the time. And then I have other solutions nutritionally that 
work a certain percentage of the time too. So if you try different things, it's not going to cost you hardly anything. And uh, you, you might get uh, find something that works for you. But there's several different reasons uh, for this. There could be a little calcium uh, buildup on the little hairs of the inner ear. And so my most recent video on this, uh, I, I walk you through a test to do to see if that's the problem and then the solution as well. So um, I'm always looking for updated, better remedies for various things like vertigo or tinnitus, POTS, uh, all sorts of things. And so I, I constantly are I'm putting things up. I just found something very powerful for essential tremors, which if you have that, well, you're going to be very happy to watch this video I'm going to release hopefully next week. Very good, Doc. We haven't talked about your app in a long time. Is that a, a great place, uh, a great thing for them to download on both Android and uh, uh, I, iOS or OS? iOS, excuse me. Especially if you're, you know, like if you're driving and you don't, you can't watch it, you can just listen to the audio and you can listen to these, uh, all the videos. I, I up, upload them on the app. It's a free app. And then I have a lot of additional downloads and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, that's a great Great way to, uh, you know, find uh, information too, because we have a good search engine on that. Because sometimes you can't find it on YouTube anymore. Uh, you can definitely find it on my app or my website. All right, very good. Now I can't imagine what would possess anyone to eat castor oil. Maybe it's good for you, Doc. But Lily from YouTube says, "Can castor oil worsen hot flashes? Mine have gotten worse since taking it." That's interesting. Then don't take it. But there's definitely uh, certain properties in castor oil that. You know, a lot of people take it as a laxative, but it does a lot of other things. It's great for your skin, really good for the skin, all types of skin problems. But also people take it orally for many different reasons too, anti-inflammatory and antioxidant. But, you know, you're going to have to find something else that might help you with hot flashes. You, you could try iodine. That could help you. Um, also, um, DIM might help you, a product called DIM. And so I have a, a list of things uh, that you can try. But, you know, one of these things where you have to, um, you know, we don't necessarily have all the research that's done on all these natural remedies because who's going to pay for it? So you have to try things, see what works, see. And uh, there's a lot of other variables like your diet and your history and your genetics. And there's so many different variables. So what I like to do is kind of give you the most likely things that would produce good change, go ahead and try them. And um, versus, <clears throat> you know, keep getting thousands and thousands of dollars worth of testing to try to figure out what's going on, which it's, it's very expensive. All right, very good. Why don't we launch into our first quiz question, first of five today. And here's the first one, Doc. All right, so I'm looking for it. And for some reason, it's not. All right, well, I will accommodate my... you. What is the worst protein in the world? Got it. Yeah. Okay. Leap on that, uh, folks. And uh, can't wait to hear your answers. Let's go back to social media. Uh, media, excuse me. Una from YouTube. Which herbs block opiate receptors? Or do they? Um, I, I don't know which ones inhibit the opioid receptors. I don't know. Um, and are you trying to resolve, if you're, are you trying to resolve an addiction? If you are, then that's a different story. In fact, um, there is uh, some great data on addictions um, that I will be releasing a video on that as well. And um, if you use high doses of a type of vitamin B3 called niacinamide, not the niacin, but the niacinamide. And when I say high doses, I'm talking only like 250 milligrams. And you had that six to eight times a day, that can greatly help that condition. Um, if you use niacin, you want to use a, a, um, a higher amount. You want to use between uh, 1.8 grams to three grams a day. And that's really good for addictions as well, especially to nicotine, alcohol, and um, if I'm not mistaken, it does affect the opiate receptor as well because it just kind of decreases the 
uh, the need for that um, stimulation and that receptor. So, um, cause I remember running over briefly something about opioid receptors improving that, but I can't tell you the details because I don't remember all the specifics, but that'll, I think that should put you on the right track. All right. Very good. Why don't we go to our green room now? I, I caution uh, or that we have a international audience. I don't want to say caution. We're excited about that, but these are my peeps. So Farhan, who is originally from Pakistan, uh, is living in Herndon, Virginia, and that's an area I used to get in a lot of trouble in, my old hometown. So we're so glad to have my brother Farhan on today to discuss uh, his certain concerns. So Farhan, you are on with Dr. Burr. Go with your one question. By the way, Dr. Burke, I might caution the audience couldn't hear um, Farhan. So if you don't mind recapping his question real quickly for the audience. an autoimmune, but it's related to, um, stress. So, um, she took some medication It got better. Now it's on the other side of her body. So, uh, I would recommend, um, taking a good natural B1, B1. And so, um, I think it's called all allothionine, uh, is the one I would recommend. And I would probably double or triple the dosage and start taking that and really make sure that her diet is very, very good. Okay. Um, and I would, um, put her on that and then watch my videos on vitiligo. Just so you could, if you're, if I'm missing anything there, you can get some more details on that. Okay. And by the way, audience. So and Farhana, I, I trust that you heard all that and that's great. The audience was unable to hear most of that, including your, uh, answer on that system. So audience, forgive us, we're having trouble with this remote system. So uh, the rest of you folks who are in the green room, I'd love for you to be able to um, maybe just text us and let us know uh, what your concern is. And we're gonna have to stick with Dr. Berg's single camera here because everyone can hear that. So Farhan, I hope that was helpful to you. Uh, we may come up with some remedy during the show to do that. In the meantime, let's go back to social media. Uh, Joan from YouTube, which foods can reduce inflammation of the pancreas? Um, foods that don't stress the pancreas, foods that are high in antioxidants, uh, foods that are high in omega-3 fatty acids, um, avoiding the omega-6 seed oils for sure, avoiding the processed overly refined foods like the bread, pasta, cereal, crackers, biscuits, waffles, pancakes, muffins, sodas, juice, and high fructose corn syrup, because all those will just um, really uh, get those uh, pancre pancreatic cells overproducing insulin. And, you know, think about this, like the cell that uh, con controls blood sugars is insulin, and it's produced by the pancreas. And uh, think about what's happening if you're overstimulating that cell to the rest of the gland. I mean, you can develop pancreatitis as well. But sometimes you get pancreatitis from um, a, a, a little blockage in the um, bile ducts, which then spreads over into the pancreatic ducts. So uh, a really good remedy for inflammation of the pancreas would be tudka. Tudka. And then of course, change your diet. 
Okay, very good. Let's see. Let's move on to Maya Baya from Rumble. Thank you so much for all the information you share. I have been on healthy keto for five years and eat only one meal a day. It is amazing. The only craving I have uh, are for fatty cheese and sour cream. Doesn't sound like a big sin. Are those cravings normal or do they indicate a nutritional deficiency of some sort? I think I would I would eat those uh, things. I would eat those things. I I like um, like especially if you're craving fat. Oh my gosh, consume the fatty cheese. Just make sure it's quality. If you can find some good European cheese that's raw, that would be awesome. But there are some you could be needing something in that cheese for sure. So um, you know maybe you need some calcium. All right, very good. Let's uh, answer quiz question number one, which asked, uh, what is the worst protein in the entire world? Audience, 97% of our respondents say it's soy or soy isolates, and 3% say non-organic dairy. So that's interesting because you're close. Soy protein isolates is number two. But number one is something called textured vegetable protein, AKA textured soy protein. Now, this was a waste product from the seed oil industry. It was invented in 1960. I mean, they use like temperatures of almost at 400 degrees Fahrenheit uh, with chemicals, hexane. You know it's gonna be GMO because most of soy is GMO. But the way they process it, it kind of fluffs up. It denatures this protein so much. It deforms its shape, and it's full of holes to the point where it can absorb three times its weight in fluid it's because it's like this sponge. And it's in these foods. It's in the so, so-called uh, healthy plant-based burgers and the nuggets. I remember I was at the... Uh, I was at Whole Foods once, and I saw these chicken nuggets, what I thought to be chicken nuggets. So I ordered them. I'm like, wow, they're really, they're all nicely shaped. I wonder how they did that. So I'm driving home. I'm eating these. Wow, these are really good because they're kind of, that protein is very bland. So they have to add the MSG, which is usually made out of soy, and a lot of flavor enhancers. I'm like, wow, these are really, these are actually too good. By the time I got home, I looked in the mirror and my eyes were completely bloodshot. I'm like, what is going on? I felt so sick. I'm like, what was in those? You're, you're consuming something that has no long-term safety studies with humans, short-term studies on rats. I mean, who knows if it was the accumulated hexane solvent, which is, by the way, 3% of uh, gasoline is hexane, the solvent, uh, or some other toxic chemical, or you're consuming something so refined um, because when you have like a, a pure protein, whether it's soy protein isolates or just a pure protein and no fat or nothing else, you have to metabolize that protein in the liver. So you're, you're going to start pulling from the reserve to metabolize it and get it to make new tissue. So you basically deplete your vitamin A, E, K, D and minerals as well. There's a reason why in nature, protein doesn't just come as a protein. It comes as all these different th things. So when I was um, in practice, I, people would come in on the, it's called the ideal protein. And they were, the, the main protein for that was called uh, so I, um, soy isol uh, protein isolates, which is very similar. And I noticed that they had one for one, they just didn't look healthy. And they create a lot of, they have a lot of liver issues. And now I know why, because it just sucks the uh, nutrients right out of the liver. And, you know, the solvents probably are not that good for your liver. So that would be the worst um, because it's so unnatural and it is basically an alter process in ingredient. And it's in the, uh, the I think it's in the, the children's uh, lunches and, um, I know they use uh, soy protein isolates in, in infant formula in some of them, unfortunately. But yeah, I um, it's not not the not the highest quality protein. Oh, uh, okay, kids, that's yucky. So watch out for that, even though I know you can't identify it. But let's watch that, parents. 
Sounds like some gross stuff. Okay, why don't we go ahead with quiz question number two, and I'm going to assume you can't see that, Doc. So it asks, question, what is the healthiest protein, the healthiest protein as opposed to the worst in the entire world? And while the audience is climbing on that, I'm going to try an experiment and just see, without bringing these people up, if we can hear from them. So, um, Shireen, can you, he can you hear me? And, and let me hear you talk, see if we can hear you over the air. She's unmuting herself. And Dr. Burr, can you hear her? I can hear her. This is fabulous. Okay, we can't put you on the screen, but we would love to hear your question. So one question, 30 seconds, Shireen. Go ahead. Okay, Doc, you'll have to recap that because they couldn't hear that even though you could. Yeah, so her daughter had the vaccine for the flu and had some bad reactions. Now she has skin problems. And um, what can she do? She's eating fairly good foods. I think what I would do if I were you, I would um, give her um, high doses of vitamin C, number one. Like um, I would do, I mean, you can do easily three grams a day. Um, and kind of go up till she has diarrhea and back off. And then that way you'll have, you know, you'll have, um, you won't overdo it because you really can't overdo it with vitamin C anyway. It's water soluble. So uh, that's one thing. The second thing I would do is I would, um, I would give her 10,000 IUs of vitamin D3 because the vitamin D3 is going to help modulate that immune system, that inflammatory immune issue. Um, if you could find a, a good zinc supplement in a base of the trace minerals, that would be another thing I would give her. And these are just things for her immune system to calm down the overactive immune system because what happened is that you bypassed the normal immune immigration and went right into the bloodstream and now there's a reaction. So now we have to kind of um, chill out that immune system. That's what I would do. Vitamin C, D, and zinc. Okay, Shireen, nobody can hear you, but I saw you nodding your head, so the most important thing is that you got some great counsel from Dr. Berg and audience and those in the green room. We're going to ask our staff to kind of cue you up again for next week once we get our issues behind us. So let's go to um, quiz question. Uh, let's see if we got an answer for that. We do. Quiz question number two, which asked, instead of the worst, which is the best protein in the entire world? And the audience has an opinion. 75% say it's grass-fed beef. 10% say it's eggs. I love those. 10% say it's liver. And 5% say it's fatty fish. All sounds like delicious stuff. So if we take a look at the best protein, that would be something that supplies the most actual protein that goes in your body, bioavailable, um, and all the other factors that go with it. The nutrients, the B vitamins, the minerals, the selenium, iron, um, all the other additional things that actually help um, support mus muscle th synthesis as well. And that would be um, the red meat, the exact thing that people are telling you to avoid. Now, what is the big difference between some of these animals like you have goat, sheep, cow, buffalo versus pig, chicken? Well, the, 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 if when you have a digestive system that's a lot longer in these animals, like a sheep, goat, cow, um, you get, um, you, they don't, and especially if it's grass fed, you're not going to get all the, the metabolites of, of, from grains, omega 6. So you're going to get a better uh, nutrition in that animal and grass fed, grass finished. So goat, sheep, and cow are the, are the best meats. Now, eggs are good too, but I will say that there, they, there is going to be higher amounts of omega-6. However, there's a lot of other good things in eggs, so I'm not saying not to have them, but uh, if we were just to weigh it out, um, pork, chicken, super high in omega-6, unless you, know, you can find a farmer that 
you know, you, that doesn't feed them all these refined grain or these grains. Now, the wild boar uh, is probably super healthy because they live off the land. But where are you going to find uh, a boar? Maybe in the woods? Maybe not. So um, I still eat pork. Um, best just because I basically feed them myself and I know when I feed them and it's no soy, no corn. So um, I'm going to have a much lower profile, but it's, it is difficult to find a farmer. Now there are farmers at the farmer's market that uh, feed their pigs, other things like from the fruit trees and stuff like that. If you can find one, great, but corn and soy, we have a big problem with omega-6. And if you have um, inflammation, uh, probably need to cut down on your omega-6 fatty acids. There is also um, Angels Acres, uh, it's a company, and they're, they're starting to raise chickens um, with a much lower ratio of omega-6 fatty acids. And um, that's what I'm doing as well. Um, of course, I'm not selling my eggs, but there are companies that you can get eggs from that are in that category. I will do a video on eggs coming up soon because I... I'm not saying don't eat them, but just that you want to have the ones that are pasture raised organic. That would be the, the best option if you're at the store. Okay, we were able to communicate via type through our green room, and Safina has a question that I'm going to read for you, Dr. Berg. My daughter is a seven year old and she is diagnosed with nephoric syndrome. She gets relapse. Uh, did we ask this question? I don't think so. She gets a relapse every uh, once in a while. How can I prevent protein and albumin in her urine, even though she eats home food with low sodium diet and drinks celery juice five times a week? How much vitamin D should she take for healthy kidney function? Does that make sense? So is this from um, Laura? No, this is from Safina. Safina. Um, I don't know what that condition is, though. What, what's that condition, Let's Safina? Let's see. It's new, uh, yeah. Uh, new for Neftoric syndrome, N-E-P-H-T-O-R-I-C, hmm. nephoric syndrome. Okay, She's... all right. Okay, so it's a nephrotic, uh, nephrotic problem. It's a problem with the kidney, and now she has protein in the urine, and she also has something else in the urine. Let's see, she has an albumin. Albumin, okay. Yeah, so what happens is when you have uh, damage to the, the little uh, nephrons, which are filters, and then this protein leaks in there. It should be recycled, but now it's leaking. So we have a hole uh, in the kidney. And um, now the question is, what can she do? She's doing celery juice. That's great. Um, so in this situation, there's a couple things that I would do. There's a company called Standard Process. I'm not affiliated with that company, but there's a product called... Um, um, it is called... Renatrophin, okay, Renatrophin, PMG. And there's another one called Arena Food. Arena Food, standard process. Get both of those, have her start taking it based on what's on the directions. Those are very specific to the kidney to support the kidney itself. Um, the one, the thing that I always think about with kidney is um, you have to be very careful about. Um, any type of glucose. So I'm guessing, I'm assuming that she's on a zero carbohydrate or a zero sugar diet, hopefully. N no sugar. Because that um, that can actually punch holes in there as well. Um, the other thing I think that um, if you, she did the healthy version of keto, which I'm, she could be doing right now already, you know, you're doing high quality food. So you wouldn't want to do just regular food. You know, you want to do something that with um, the organic grass fed and, and then be very gentle on the kidneys um, and not force her to drink more water than she's thirsty. It's got to really kind of let those kidneys heal up. Um, there are a number of things that can speed up healing of tissue. Resveratrol uh, can do it as well. So you can try that as a supplement. But I think I would stick with that and not overload the kidney with too much. Um, but I do understand there's a disorder there. And um, go ahead and try that. And uh, let's see what happens. And then come back and let's reevaluate, see if she's any better. Um, you can also do those home strips 
they're very inexpensive just to check her urine every day to see if it's getting better rather than going to the doctor and like, I don't know how far you go, but you could, there are strips that you can test your urine to see if there's protein in the urine and uh, that would be beneficial. Well, I'm so grateful Dr. Berg could transcribe my butchered medical uh, nomenclature. So that is terrific. Tracy from YouTube, what are your thoughts about biologic uh, produce? Uh, I've seen more and more of it in my Whole Foods store, and quite frankly, they don't taste the same as regular produce. What's the difference? You know, I have not done a deep dive in that. I don't know. Um, I, I don't know enough to give you an opinion, so I'll have to dive into that, but I have not looked at that. I guess I haven't. Maybe I'm going to a different grocery store than you are, but I haven't seen that label. But course i'm always suspect if anything anything sounds biological like what what are they doing but i couldn't give you an opinion so i'll have to pass in that question do you have an easier one i do michael angelo from youtube i think it's easy which complimentary test should i ask for in order to figure out whether i should be taking statins (laughs) is that loaded you have to take an iq test no just kidding (laughs) um so yeah um i have my own viewpoint on statins it blocks cholesterol it also depletes coenzyme q10 um i don't know if you saw that recent study out there they compared oreo cookies to statin drugs and guess which actually came out better oreo cookies oh my god so that would be one remedy um being sarcastic but um, the question is, what, what, yeah, I don't know how to put these things in my ear. What problem are you trying to solve? If you're trying to solve lowering of cholesterol, there are so many other things you can do. Let's say, for example, your cholesterol is high and you're concerned about it. And let's say your LDL, the, the bad LDL is, is not good. And maybe you have a genetic weakness and your diet is, and you tried the diet and it still doesn't work. Well, guess what? You, you can try red yeast extract. That, that's kind of a natural version of statins. You can also try um, uh, natal kinase. Uh, these are all things. And, and niacin, oh my gosh, niacin. Um, drug companies have spent billions to try to patent niacin. I mean, it is hands down the only thing out there that can increase HDL, good cholesterol. Um, there's no drug that can do it. So... Why don't you go in that area? Yeah, I'll tell you, a relative in my family was on statins and just gave it up. The side effects were so gruesome and, um, you know, they had some issues off of it. So I hope, you know. You know, Steve, uh, you know, I, I, have, I have this, I bought this textbook. It's like this thick and it's on cell membranes. It's on a, I'm sure it's a, a hot, hot selling book because a lot of people are interested in cell membranes. Um, no, not really. (laughs) So, um, so it's, it's a bit technical, but it's super interesting because you're going a deep dive into what these cell membranes are and how important they are. And, and you know what, every single cell in the body has a cell membrane. All the things inside the cell have a membrane too. And if you were to stretch out those membranes, uh, you would have a very large, uh, surface area, several football fields. So these membranes are protective, they're structural, they allow information, communication to go through, minerals, they do a lot. They allow you to um, have, to be alive with uh, like the different um, concentrations, just like a battery. You have a certain concentration over here and a different concentration over here and it, you have it travel, you have these electrons that travel. So. So you always need these these membranes to keep these two things separate to have things work. Well, guess what? That membrane is dependent on cholesterol. Yes, that's correct. And so you start cutting down cholesterol, um, and then what happens to the cell membranes? You know, yeah, okay, you're going to tank your sex hormones, your brain, your mood, your cognitive function, your ability to make vitamin D, your bile, but what about your cell membranes? I suppose you haven't really thought about that, Steve, have you? Very little. 
<laughs> Hell, I'll send you the book when I'm done with it, okay? When I'm done reading it, I'll send it to you. I can't even pronounce any of this stuff, much less contemplate it, for goodness sakes. But I can contemplate our next question, which uh, I will read for the audience. And this is a true falser, 50-50 chance of being a genius. Fast food restaurants can reuse frying oil over a hundred uh, over a hundred times uh, until it tastes like sewer fish, I guess. Is that true or false, audience? Wouldn't surprise me if it was. Um, now let's go back to um, Sam at YouTube. What's the best remedy for acne? That stinks. In a man in his 30s. I would take um, vitamin B3, niacin. I think niacin would help you. Of course, I would also look at your diet, uh, make sure that your sugar's down because the sugar can increase excessive androgens um, that can then cause acne. There's a lot of different remedies for acne. You know, you can try vitamin E and you can try vitamin A, but not necessarily in the form of the synthetic as Accutane because it has side effects. I don't even know if it's still on the market, but I think I would start with the diet. And then niacin would be a really good remedy for that and see what happens. But um, yeah, um, it's usually related to androgens because the androgen makes these uh, these oil glands bigger if you have too much androgen. So this is why people in their, um, in their teens get it, but you can get it when you get older as well. Okay, very good. Uh, Black Pint from YouTube, I lost 40 pounds in three months. Woo, just doing healthy keto and intermittent fasting. Thank you, Dr. Berg. So no concern here, just the great joy of being healthier, feeling better, and living longer. So good for you, Black Pink. Um, let's see. Let's move on to <laughs> Mattel Grape. So Black Pink, now Mattel Grape. Dr. Berg, you might want to know that Bobby Green, the UFC fighter, mentioned you in a recent interview. That's pretty cool. I guess he's wow. a keto fanatic and can definitely... Beat your butt, I'm sure. Uh, on to uh, Kay Tamori uh, from YouTube. Would you recommend drinking organic milk for someone in their 50s versus 51? Organic milk? Yes, sir. Yeah, as long as you're not over 50. Uh, but under 50, yes, you can do it. <laughs> okay. Now, I, I think um, you have raw milk, which I highly recommend. But when you get into organic milk, that's better. But you got to be careful uh, uh, with the milk because the pasteurization uh, kills this enzyme called alkaline phosphatase. And when you actually um, don't have that enzyme, you can start to um, develop um, a little bit too much calcification. And I'm not saying this is going to happen to you, but the accumulated effect um, is interesting because as you may know, as we all age, we tend to calcify the joints, the arteries, the tissues, we start to get stiff. So anything that um, contributes to that, you know, it's probably not a good idea. So if you can find some raw milk, you know, uh, it's illegal in my state. So you have to buy the cow for, or part of it to get the milk. And then you have to smuggle it over the border and then do low crawl for about 50 feet and then grab the milk and run back. So, but there's different ways to, um, overcome this um but stay tuned for a video i will do on calcification like another reason why people turn into stone so stay tuned for that video all right so let's go to debbie from youtube any suggestions for fixing dry eye syndrome absolutely uh you need vitamin a a vitamin a deficiency but don't get it from a supplement get it from either cod liver oil or egg yolk or beef liver because that vitamin A um, deficiency will cause dry eye. All right. Uh, we have an answer from the question uh, that asks, true, false, fast food restaurants can reuse frying oil uh, over 100 times. The audience feels it's true, at least 95% of them, and 5% say, I hope not, think it's false. Now, I'm not saying every everyone does that, but um, they have been known to do that, and even even more, more times. Um, so you can imagine if you're going to reheat this fried oil over and over and over and over again, could you imagine how much 
rancidity, rancidity and toxicity is going to be created in that oil that you're going to eat things from that food. Talk about inflammation. You know, you know what they do with the oil after um, they use it for a long time, Steve, at the fast food restaurants? I actually do. You know that. Well, they, I did a, a, yeah, a film on it for a municipality, and they have these dumps outside the restaurant. It's the most disgusting. And they pump it out and take it somewhere, but it's gruesome. It's the smelliest oh, stuff I've it ever must, heard. It must have changed, changed the dump because it's too toxic for the landfill. So what they do is they have a recycling plant. And uh, they can uh, break it down, recycle it, and put it right back into the food supply as pet food and uh, also as uh, animal food. Well, actually, they do. They pump it in these big trunks, but they have this sort of holding tank outside the restaurants, and they hold it. So, yes, they very well take it somewhere. So you're probably right. It ends up in Fido's gut uh, next, I suppose. But it's some nasty, nasty stuff. You can't get the smell off you for two days. Steve, just... Just don't, this weekend, don't start watching uh, Soil and Green, okay? Please just don't. <laughs> Absolutely not. Okay, let's go to another question. Uh, this one, true, false. Bring it up for the audience. Um, the thyroid stores most of the iodine in the body. And I would just somehow assume that's true myself, but let's hear what the audience has to say. So climb on that, folks. Okay, let's see. Mystic from YouTube, during a prolonged fast, is it okay to have lemon water with honey at noon, vegetable broth at 5.30, and decaf coffee with honey at 10 p.m., or will any of that break my fast? I have a guess. Okay, on one hand, yes, it's going to break your fast. On the other hand, I will say it's a different breaking of the fast than if you were to have some other food because it's going to create a spike and it's going to come down. Uh, when you do things like pasta, you get us, it just goes on and on and on and on a lot longer. So that's that's one little point. Um, and then the other point is that if if you did, because I, I noticed you didn't say sugar, right? Uh, you said honey. Honey has some very unique, mysterious properties, especially for diabetic. Um, it's fascinating, um, even though it does have both fructose and glucose. Uh, it could be just all the phytochemicals in that honey that create like a countering effect of diabetic uh, complications. So it's an interesting thing. And I think if you're metabolically flexible, you could probably get away with it here and there. But uh, for the most of the population, I'd probably not recommend it right now because we're trying to uh, be, have you become insulin sensitive and and adding more carbs, probably not the best thing in the world. Okay, so we got some uh, transmission from uh, Leora. From, no, I'm sorry, this is Safina. We already went to that. Leora, I want you to type in a question for me if you haven't already. Let's go back to social media. If you want, if you want her to ask me real quick, I can hear her. Okay, let's do that. Go ahead. Hang on. Let me unmute you. Make sure you're unmuted. And go ahead and ask Dr. Bergen. Audience, if you'd bear with us, you're not going to be able to hear her for a second. Go ahead. Okay. So let me repeat, let me just repeat your question. So you, you, uh, been contemplating this ketogenic diet for about a year now. And so the problem you're running into, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So she can't seem to do it because the fats really get her and, uh, it creates uh, almost like a gastritis symptom and on the left side, uh, which is interesting. Because um, you have um, the gallbladder, which you think, wow, that why isn't that being affected? Well, the way the ducts cross over to the pancreas side too, they both kind of join together right at that little small intestine. So it could very easily go right to the left and kind of block the pancreatic, pancreatic area and create pain underneath the left rib cage. So what do you do? 
um, yeah, you're going to have to, um, obviously there's some, some issues with fat that, uh, you, you need better fat digestion. So what I would do is I would, I would do the ketogenic diet, uh, but just do lower amounts of fat and then really support it with some key nutrients to really make sure you break down those fats. Now we've always talked about bile salts, right? That's really important. And yes, I would do that. But what about pancreatic enzymes, specifically lipase? So if you take lipase with that, I think that could probably solve your problem. Now, in an empty stomach, while you're fasting between meals, I would add in there that tub cup. Why? Because that just opens up all those little ducts and allows the drainage to flow. And, um, you know, ultimately, if we're dealing with fat problems, we're ultimately dealing with the liver problem because the liver makes um, bile. So, you know, anything you can do to support that would be wonderful. Milk thistle is one really good thing, but um, but for right now, you just go you go lower fat, and um, you keep those ducts open up, and then give it more time. I, I ran into this exact same problem. So, um, what you don't want to do is do all these MCT oil or coconut oil and higher fats, but that would just like kill you. So, uh, do that, and um, gradually over time, I think you're going to get better and better and better. You're welcome. Okay, Leora, thanks, uh, Dr. Berg and the audience for listening, and thank you for being patient with us. Terrific, we're able to get to them, and let me mute her out for my purposes. And uh, we have an answer for quiz question number four today, uh, which asked of the audience, uh, true, false, thyroid stores most of the iodine in the body, and they kind of split on this 50-50, Doc. Who's right? Yeah, it's actually not true. It's not true. Huh. It doesn't... It stores a good amount, right? But there's other tissues that store iodine almost just as much. The breast tissue, the ovaries, the eye, the gastric lining. Um, so there's there's quite a few tissues in your body that store iodine. So it's not just all about the thyroid. In fact, every single cell in your body stores iodine. So um, iodine is very protective. Uh, iodine um, can prevent a problem with excess estrogen, especially if it forms in the, um, the ovaries like as a cyst or even in the breast as a cyst, as in fiber cystic breast problem. Some women um, can put it, um, add um, Lugol's, uh, iodine in some oil and rub it on the breast tissue it goes right in gets rid of the problem very fast um, iodine is extremely anti-cancer to the breast tissue the prostate cancer I'm, I'm sorry prostate tissue and other like colon as well so you see very low um, rates of cancer especially in the breast in Japan and it just so happens, what a coincidence that they consume 25 times the amount of iodine that Americans consume. What a what an interesting coincidence. Um, so I think you that's interesting, and I think you're going to find the next question that we're going to get to is going to be even more interesting. Let's get to it. Next one is true-false. Iodine is the only trace mineral that can be safely ingested in amounts 100,000% of the RDAs. Um, that seems very radical, but audience, what do you think? Is it true or false that you can do that? And this is the only one. Uh, so climb on that, and I hope you're right. So you can um, congratulate yourself on your great knowledge on iodine. Okay, Amaya from Rumble. Thank you so much for all the information you share. I have been on healthy keto for five years and only eat one meal a day. It is amazing. The only cravings I have are for fatty. Oh, sorry, I already did that one, Doc. Um and those cravings are fine. I should have erased that. Okay, Jacqueline from YouTube. Do I need to avoid foods that list natural ingredients on the label? And what are they exactly? I guess that's all. The, they just say natural ingredients and don't give you any more clues. Hey, listen, if they say natural, you know it must be natural. It's probably good. And so you really want to focus on that keyword <laughs> natural because um, that gives you a lot of information. Um, that I, I just did a really interesting video on this and I showed... Um, a couple examples of this 
Um, if you look at the nutrition facts on the back of the label, it basically is worthless. And I'm going to show you why in this video, because you can't even tell, you can't tell if something is good or bad. Really, if you look at that, you have to look at the ingredients. That's what you focus on. And so uh, I did a video on showing the difference between um, an avocado and Doritos. Okay. And the first thing I did, I show you the supplemental facts. And the one that's in the Doritos looks a lot better <laughs> until you look at the actual ingredients. So when you read labels, which I highly recommend you read labels, um, you really identify. There's actually three things that you're looking for. The sugars, the starches, and the seed oils. And um, I'm going to release a video on that this week. And, and then you can actually um, do a download of a little cutout for your wallet. So that way you have, you're at the store and you just, you remember some of these names to avoid. Because, um, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a problem. And, but to keep it simple, you know, we just stick with like avoiding three things. Should we get, should we avoid the artificial colorings and the flavorings? Yeah, but let's just do that. Let's just put that as a side note. That's not the most important thing. There's something even more important, and it's those three ingredients. You, if you avoid those, you're going to be in a, a lot better shape. So stay tuned for that video. Okay, and here's our final quiz question of the day, which asks, iodine is the only trace mineral that can be safely ingested in amounts 100,000% of the RDAs. And there was a little split here, Doc where 51% said yes, and 49% were hesitant and said no. It's actually true. In fact, I think if I, I think I even made a mistake, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna verify that later today, and I will put that in the comments. I don't even think it was a 100,000%. I think it was 100,000 times. Now you're saying, no way, but there's some interesting data on this. I'm gonna share with you in a video that, um, you know, people are, if, if you're concerned about taking too much iodine, well, yes, if you're, if you have, if you have hypothyroidism, yes, avoid that. Or if you have a, some type of growing nodule on your thyroid, you know, avoid that. But apparently our bodies can handle a lot of iodine. And uh, there's a, usually the problem is we're very deficient in iodine. Uh, it's hard to get it from our diet. I mean, ha Steve, when's the last time you ate seaweed? Um, what? <laughs> no, I don't eat much of that. I'm sure it's some sushi joint. You know, I probably had some, but no, I don't eat it. Yeah. So it's becoming harder to, and, and if your um, mother didn't have enough iodine when you're pregnant, your, uh, your IQ is going to be lower. So it affects not just, um, you know, thyroid and preventing it with cancer, but also uh, your intelligence, your brain development, a lot of things. So it's a very important trace mineral. These little trace minerals, you know, you, you, when you start refining foods down to the basic macro element and you don't have all these micro elements in there anymore, um, of course, they put some back in, vitamin, like B1 and iron, things like that. But when you're missing these things, you're it's not natural and it's going to create problems and it's going to create deficiencies. And, uh, you know, every, almost every single ingredient in junk food is considered safe by the FDA. It's called GROSS, generally recognized as safe. Interesting. And it's a loophole because the manufacturing companies can pretty much do their own studies. Could be potentially biased, but I don't know, Steve, what do you think? Well, <laughs> boy, that's a hard nut to crack. Who's right? Who's wrong? Who's lying? Who's not? Uh, who has reasons to lie? Who doesn't? Money, 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 and so on. But anyway, let's do an absolute um, social media marathon for the last two or three minutes yeah. we have. And Boca from you, uh, uh, Bokia from YouTube, how much berberine should I take to address my rheumatoid arthritis issues? I, I would, whatever it says in the label, times four. And I would spread it out through the day. Oh, good. I hope that works. Uh, Macha Veli from YouTube. What are your thoughts on dry fasting? How long should I do the first one? 
I, I would start out with, before you do dry fasting, you want to hydrate your body really good for a couple of days. Really hydrate your body with electrolytes as well, not just water. Because if you ever notice, Steve, when you try to hydrate with water, do you end up peeing it out very soon afterwards? I seem to. Yeah. And then sometimes people say, well, oh yeah, well, you need to drink all the water in the morning because you're dehydrated all night long. Well, unless you're peeing all night long, okay. But what if you're not peeing all night long? Are you really that dehydrated? So you you want to initially hydrate and then you want to go for, um, you know, you want to go all the way maybe till dinner and then drink all the water you'd normally drink between dinner and maybe two hours. And so you're basically not drinking through the day. So that would be a good start to do that for a period of time. And then you can go a little bit longer, a little bit longer, but just don't go over 10 days without drinking water. Whew. So gradually work up to it. There's some great data. And, um, you know, the thing about water is that, uh, I think it's you're going to create a very interesting effect similar to fasting if you're also doing intermittent, not sustained, but just not drinking so much and just start to do that through the day, like maybe drink a lot of your water one hour of the day and then see see what happens to your health. I think it's a great added stress if you can tolerate it um, to improve um, your health, just like exercise is a stress. But the key is not to do it sustain, in a s sustained way. Um, and the other thing I want to mention is you have to be kind of healthy to do that. Because just like even fasting, even exercise, you start doing it while you're really sick and you, know, you have a lot of atrophy. You got to go so slow because we don't want to add this like a lot of fasting and stress if you're weak. So you have to be pretty healthy to handle stress or stressors. Hmm. How about one last one, Doc? Deb from YouTube, can we take Tudka without a gallbladder? Especially, especially because that's the thing you should have taken to pre prevent the loss of the gallbladder because you still have these ducts and you can still get gallstones in the ducts, little tubes. So I think it, it'll make you feel better. But just realize this, that's a bile salt. And one way you know you have too much bile salt is by having diarrhea. So if you have any type of diarrhea, back off because that means you have too much bile. On that note, on that note thank you for watching this long. I appreciate all of your wonderful comments. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next time.